Good afternoon and welcome to this week's Thunderdome live chat. We're streaming to you live from Thunderdome headquarters in New York City. Uh, today we'll be talking with Craig Silverman, director of content at Sponge and founder and editor of Regret the Era. Craig, welcome to Thunderdome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, there's a lot we'd like to talk to you about. Um, I'm only going to talk about two things, and that's it. I'm sorry. Do you think what are the two things? I don't know. Let's just pick two. Um, okay. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I was thinking when I came in here, if your business is journalistic errors, well, business must be good. Yeah, it's too busy. It's a little too much, and it's the kind of business where the, when there's a lot, you just feel terrible, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. yeah, overwhelming at times, I'm sure. Um, and we're also here with Julie Westfall, our breaking news editor at Thunderdome. Hello. <laughs> um, so, uh, last week came with a lot of complex questions, whether you were a media critic or in the media yourselves. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how um, you guys used Sponge last week to uh, report on the Boston Marathon bombings? Sure. Um, I mean, one of the reasons, one of the major reasons we use Sponge. Um, <coughs> Uh, came in very useful on Monday, which is that we use it to um, get updating stories to our properties. So obviously when something this big breaks, there's a lot more to come after it, um, and you want to have a running story of some kind. So we started one here um, with probably like just a couple paragraphs of wire copy or whatever we were able to cobble together on our own, push that out, and kept updating it throughout the entire day. Mm -hmm. And we're able to do that by just sending an embed code out, and then from here, just um, continuing to update through that embed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we there were definitely a lot of updates to that story throughout the week. There were hundreds, yes. Um, but I, I realized that maybe our viewers at home don't really understand what Sponge is. Sure. Uh, Craig, could you tell us a little bit about what the product does? Yeah. Um, so. You know, as a starting point, we sort of looked at what's what goes on in the newsroom, and where perhaps things break down a little bit. And, and our feeling was that um, a lot of people have a content management system, but a content management system is good for kind of the front end of your website and as a database for your content. But the actual writing and research, and collaboration and editing tools in most newsrooms kind of suck, to be honest. Um, so what we did was we've put together a product that has a workflow that can take a journalist and a team of journalists um, from gathering and tracking content, um, you know, staying on top of their beat using multiple information sources in one place, so like RSS feeds, social media, um, wire services. Put that all in one place so you can filter it and save the best. Uh, collaborate with colleagues and then have a text editor that enables you to do things like drag and drop in social media content, easily add embeds, um, easily collaborate with other people. And then you basically can push a button and it either goes right to your CMS and publishes or as you guys just described, you can generate an embed code, put that on any website and then update that over time. So it's kind of a, it's an end-to-end -end workflow platform for content tracking, curation, and, uh, and publishing. And in the folks here at Thunderdome are, were actually one of our earliest customers. Um, so it's nice to be here. Uh, when did Sponge start um, offering the product to the public? Um, so we went into public beta in October of last year, basically at the Online News Association conference, so late September. And we, we're still in beta right now, although we have you know, more and more customers on the platform. And it's not only news organizations now. We have some brands, some lawyers, management consultants, professors, other people who are all trying to create content. And uh, so we've been in beta now since, since you know, late September. The uh, company's been around for a little more than two years. So we actually spent you know, well over a year uh, taking the product from a prototype that we had shown to newsrooms and others into a full working product. And we continue to push new features basically every week. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, one of the things I think uh, makes it different from similar products is the feeds and notebooks uh, uh, concept. Can you describe a little bit about how a reporter could use a notebook? Yeah, um, so the notebook concept is basically giving you um, one place to track you know, all the different topics and um, you know, beat areas that you need to cover. And for me personally, uh, you know, the big thing was I used to use a combination of Google Reader, TweetDeck, Google Alerts, um, Delicious, you know, all of these things cobbled together to find a place where I can actually track stuff on my beats and areas of interest, save the stuff that matters, and keep it there in a place where I can use it when I have to write. And so we came up with this concept of a notebook where where you can have um, RSS feeds that you choose or that come from kind of a Google News-like feed. 
You can have Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Reddit, SlideShare, SoundCloud, and on and on and on, as well as things like Getty Images and other services in one place flowing into your notebook. You choose the keywords that are relevant. You choose filters like location and language. And you'll get this raw stream coming in that's been filtered by you. And then you can save the stuff that's most relevant into the notebook. It's collaborative, so you can bring in other um, you know, editors and other people, so you can all save stuff together. And you can also annotate it with notes and other things. So the notebook is kind of that starting point of being able to stay on top of your beat, being able to save the stuff that matters, and collaborate with team members to get the stuff that you need in order to figure out, OK, so what are we going to do about this? Interesting. So um, while it doesn't sound like in any way a replacement to Google Reader, it does sound like the feeds would allow you to accomplish some of the same jobs as you might use Google Reader for. Yeah, I mean, I think I would actually say that it can be a replacement for Google okay. Reader. Um, you know, you can bring in your feeds from Google Reader into Sponge. You can set up notebooks to only look at certain feeds. Um, and you can look at feeds as they come in chronologically, or you can filter by keywords and other criteria. So, I mean, our view, and it's probably not surprising since we're working on the product, we think it's you know a step forward from that. Because for me, Google Reader ended up being used by a lot of professionals, people like journalists and others, like knowledge professionals. And Google Reader was not built for a professional audience. Um, you know, it's frankly been neglected by Google for a couple of years. And Google you know, readily admitted that, I think. So um, I think that people need a better tool for that. Uh, but you can definitely do RSS reading type activity in Sponge. We've layered in a bunch of other things, though. So if the only thing you want is an RSS reader, it may have more functionality than you need. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and Julie, I was hoping you could explain a little bit about how we use the collaborative features at Thunderdome to share editing duties and other tasks. Sure. Um, <clears throat> for the notebooks, um, we, are, we are probably not making as much use of those as, as we could be right now, but we do make use of them in a couple of ways right now, including um, we have a po popular feature that we call the Bizarre Blotter, which um, is basically an aggregation of like the best police items that we can find um, from throughout the week. And we have a notebook where we um, compile and add stuff um, to the notebook. It feeds both coming from our properties and feeds coming from other places. And then we select from there and um, compile them into a story. Um, in terms of editing workflow, uh, it certainly gives us a central place to keep a, an article that is being worked on or is ready to be edited. Um, otherwise, stuff would go through email um, or could be edited possibly in a couple of the other CMSs we work with. But in this way, we can see um, who's edited what. Um, we can um, make sure that people aren't running into each other in the editing process. Um, and then we can also push changes as needed uh, through the embed process, which I just think is pretty much that. Mm -hmm. Craig, any uh, previews of what type of collaborative functionality might be coming down the pipeline? Um, well, the, the big thing that we're working on uh, that's, that we're kind of excited about is you know, relatively soon, we're actually going to bring chat into Sponge. So what that means is within a notebook and within a story, um, you'll be able to chat with the relevant people that have been added to it. Um, so the idea is, you know, right now you can actually collaborate in real time in a notebook and save items together. But in order to be able to sort of see what each other is doing and talk about that, you need chat. So that's going to be something, something we're working on right now. We expect to roll that out you know, relatively soon. Uh, and so that's a piece that I think will help newsrooms sort of keep a running conversation going in a notebook about something they're tracking um, or a, a breaking news event, and in a story to have you know, a real a trail of a conversation about the editing process. Mm -hmm. So we think that's going to yeah. help people a lot. It, that back and forth seems like it could have been useful for a lot of newsrooms last week when information yeah. was flying all over the place. That's it. I mean, and the other reality in a lot of newsrooms is that people don't necessarily sit next to each other anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, obviously, Digital First has news organizations um, all over the country, and uh, and so we see a need to find a way to bring people together virtually to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, if you had somebody in the field um, and they you had somebody back, you know, looking at what was going on in social media, they could actually, you know, be in touch in that mm -hmm. respect. So, I think that becomes more and more important. And I know that there are other news organizations that are kind of actively looking and saying. You know, we need a real-time collaborative solution to figure out how we can manage all this information. You know, the, the overload of information is just a huge challenge for everyone. I think. Yeah, and yeah. definitely apparent. Uh, trying to report on events as they unfolded. Julie, could you describe what your process is for like reconciling all that information into one sponge story? Um, yeah, I mean, it certainly depends on what, what kind of story we're working on. 
Um, but we, for instance, in the in the Boston in the Boston situation, immediately had one person just going through photos because there are a lot of photos being shared. Obviously, um, working to verify them, um, seeing you know where they had been verified in other places, and putting them into one place in order, and so, the, so that we could bring them into a sponge story, which we created immediately, which was just like the early photos from the scene, um, and it was just you know a bunch of photos basically that we had verified um, that were from the scene, <coughs> and. Um, the other way that we're able to, we, we could be able to do that a little bit better would be by going through the notebook, the notebook process mm -hmm. that he's describing here, putting those into a notebook that everyone can see mm -hmm. and everyone can access. Um, whereas, you know, the sort of rudimentary way that we're doing that now is um, to either send them by email or um, to put them into like a Google document or something like that. Interesting. Um, and while verification of user-generated content was definitely an issue last week, it also seems like essential reporting was problematic at a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. um, could you describe some of the highlights that you saw, Craig? Uh, highlights or yeah, lowlights? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Better, uh, I mean, I, th I think the I think the two of the ones that that have sort of stuck with people is is one, you know, the false reports about uh, about a suspect being in custody custody before that was the case and that was something that was put out by CNN Fox News AP I believe Boston Globe also on their Twitter account at least to put it out as well so that was one where I think a lot of people noticed that and then the second one is uh, probably what the New York Post did in terms of taking a photo that had circulated among law enforcement but was not put out publicly to say you know we're looking for these two and they took that put it on the front page called them bag men and you know yeah. tarnished two innocent people so I think those are the two that stand out for me I think for the people who are not in the media those are probably two that the average American is probably aware of um, maybe more so the first one than the second um, but you know it's one of the things that strikes me about situations like that is we're only going to see it happen again and again and again um, when big news breaks there's going to be a lot of information coming from cell phones, from s scanners, from all these different sources. Um, our job is to filter through that, to verify it, to figure it out. And different news organizations have different process. Um, it is not a universal thing. Verification is still, I think, in a lot of ways, an evolving and emerging practice. And so people are going to do things differently. There are different standards within different news organizations. Um, you know, you look at the, uh, the suspect in custody report, CNN said it had three sources. Uh, which would, for most news organizations, be pretty good. But, you know, are they three sources who would have direct knowledge or are they three sources that are questionable? And there's just ways to dive into the minutia of it. There are, you know, many, many ways to get it wrong. And, uh, and you know, being right in some cases means actually just sort of holding back and waiting and not yeah. saying anything. And that's, that's really tough. I mean, you guys, your team must have just been wanting to get the latest updates pushed as fast as possible. But at yeah. the same time, how do, you, how do you, you know, manage that with making sure you don't push something out that you're going to have to pull back? I mean, in that case, things were changing, you know, by the minute um, during those false arrest reports. And um, we had started a story citing the CNN. Um, and saying CNN was reporting what it was reporting, and as more people um, started to report that, we reported that they were reporting it, um, and uh, with all with citations, because as you know, as soon as CNN reported that, other people began questioning it. Um, so it was conflicting reports basically the whole time, which is basically what we ended up with mm -hmm. until it was disproved. Um, and you know, our rule was that you know, make sure that you're citing um, all the organizations that are reporting and what they're reporting, and um, that uh, that people are questioning it and why, mm -hmm. yeah. and we were able yeah. to do that. We just kept updating the story. And it's tough because it, I mean, if you if you looked at some of the cable news networks, you know they have to fill the airtime, and they're just starving for something new to say. And and so in the case of that, is you know, is it better for them to just you know not acknowledge that there's all these conflicting reports and just hold back, or is it better for them to say, well, there's conflicting reports. Some say this, some say that. And, you know, it's always a question of sort of, well, what's, what's actually serving the viewer, what's serving the public? And it's, you know, it's tough because there are some cases where acknowledging the confusion that's out there is, I think, a really, really good thing to do. And, and making it clear that, you know, if you're somebody who's read and seen and heard different things, we're going to validate that for you to say that, yes, that's what the situation is right now. It's chaotic. Um, and in some cases, if the information is not really well sourced, um, it's not necessarily conflicting reports. It's just, you know, there's some bad information out there right now. And it's really tough to know which is which and which, which practice to take. 
And I, I think that, again, it's, it's really an evolving practice. Um, there's some, some best practices that often get shared in the wake of these things uh, that help people out. But there's, I mean, there's a lot more of this to come, I think, is, is the reality of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I, um, building off your point about broadcast television, I think social media presences are very much the same, where there is a pressure to constantly be on. Mm -hmm. um, one of the tweets I thought was most interesting last week was from Dan Victor at the New York Times, where he said the work he was most proud of was the not tweeting in the 20 minutes when the manhunt was at its most um, high intensity. Right. But yeah, I mean, the there was... So for me, I remember in, uh, in Hurricane Sandy, you know, obviously, again, a lot of misinformation. And there were a lot of people who were sort of diving into it and, and retweeting things and doing that. And there was an element where I felt like, and, and again, the New York Times actually was very restrained in what it was putting out, particularly on its Twitter account. They realized a lot of followers, a lot of authority to that. And again, I mean, I think it seems like it's starting more and more that news organizations are actually becoming proud of what they didn't say, which is a very different and rare kind of thing. Proud of, you know, not saying something. Proud of not necessarily feeling like we have to fill you know, fill that space all the time. And so it is interesting. Um, and I think that there are times where it really does, the, where the best thing to say is either, you know, nothing at all, or to simply say, you know, we know that there's a lot of conflicting information out there. We don't feel comfortable re-reporting any of what's flowing around. And we're still working to confirm that. To let people know that you're engaged in it, but not necessarily ready to put something out there again. Right. Um, so I think, I think it's, a, it's a good value to have, to be restrained, to not feel like you have to jump in. Because, I mean, ultimately, every incremental update it's not, it's not, you're not winning battles every time, you know, it's not, it's not like people are going to remember that you had that two seconds before somebody else, and this gets said all the time, and it's obvious, but it's, I think it often gets forgotten, because naturally our adrenaline takes over, and we want to get in there, and we yeah. want to be part of the story, it's, it's inevitable for journalists. Yeah, and for our viewers at home, I definitely recommend checking out Craig's post on Regret the Error about last week, um, I thought the links to the posts by um, the Storyful guy, and the breaking yeah. news principle. We're both really instructive mm -hmm. to what you're talking about. Yeah, you know, that was one of the, so one of the, the, the points that I tried to make in my post was that, you know, what I'm sort of seeing is there's uh, some things, when there are breaking news, big breaking news errors, there are a few things that sort of come with them now. And so one of them, which is a good sign, is the organizations that do well tend to write about the fact that they did well. And it would sound like boasting, except most of the time they're actually sharing some of their best practices. So there was Corey Bergman at Breaking News who wrote about um, you know, what, what their standard is for whether they're going to put something out there. And he actually shared some internal tra chat transcripts about you know why they didn't go with something and I, that was really great because it was an example of again a news organization saying you know what we're okay we don't need to say this yet uh, and you know another one uh, the folks at Storyful who I think do an excellent job with real-time verification talking about you know some of their procedures how they chase some things down uh, and you know I, I think one of the the unfortunate sort of corollary um, trends is that sometimes in the case of New York Post when you make a big error you don't really acknowledge it well and I see this, unfortunately, happen. Uh, and I think the post has really been raked over the coals for it, which is, to be honest, a good thing. It may deter them from you know, it doing this kind of mistake again or from just not acknowledging it. But uh, it's unfortunate that there isn't always an, a sense of accountability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think about CNN last week and how John King handled that three-source problem? One of the things that really struck me about it was uh, when they made their Supreme Court decision error, you know, the health care decision, they got that wrong. Um, the, f the failure there was they had literally they had one guy in a room reading a document. So it was like a single point of failure and it failed for them. He, he didn't flip the page, you know. Um, and then in this scenario, they, it's almost like they sort of tried to learn the lesson. And they said, okay, we have three sources. I think they said, you know, at least one was federal and one was local. And they said, you know, it's from different people. We have multiple source uh, corroborations. So there's a part of me that's very sympathetic to them in that sense. But the reality is that we don't know who these sources are. They were anonymous sources. We don't know how close they were to the investigation. We don't know specifically what they told CNN. We don't know what CNN did to verify what they had said. You know, just because three people tell you the same thing, it's not good enough. It's the question of how do they know that? How did they get that information? And so my, my suspicion is that perhaps there wasn't that next level of pushing that was done to figure that out. Um, I will give them credit that they posted a correction. You know, they not only talked about it on air, but they posted it to Facebook and pushed it out in other places. 
Uh, but there is that unfortunate screen grab that everybody's seen where one part of the CNN website is reporting someone in custody and one part is reporting they're not, which is a really unfortunate scenario to have on your own homepage. Yeah. Um, another organization that I think admitted it fell short of its own guidelines was the AP, right. who we usually take to be the standard bearer for any uh, verification type problem. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that they, they typically, you know, get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a good reputation for that. I think that um, the fact that they have a good reputation for that is kind of um, self-perpetuating in the sense that people will often release information to AP because it's an authoritative source. So they kind of win out in that sense as well. Um, and the truth is we don't really know what went wrong there. They've released uh, a memo that was sent out um, that said, you know, we have good guidelines, but we didn't follow them. And um, so, so AP is sort of doing a post-mortem. Hopefully they'll share details of that. But yeah, it was, it was surprising to see them you know, go down that road. Um, I think they take it very seriously. I think they realize it, it hurts their brand and hurts the AP tradition. And uh, we'll, we'll see if you know, they're willing to share sort of if, what changes, if any, they're going to make as a result of that. Definitely. Um, Julie, I'm sitting here wondering, you know, for our reporters in the field, how do these type of concepts get uh, translated to local news? Um, you mean like verification? Mm -hmm. Verification, uh, mm -hmm. you know, admitting to and, you know, correcting errors. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, you know, most newsrooms have uh, correction policies, um, and they, they certainly, you know, follow them in print. I mean, I, I come from a, a local newsroom. I come from community news. Um, and... <clears throat> And um, you know, with blaring, you know, putting a correction in the appropriate place is is always a high value there, um, and I think it continues to be in all, in all of our local newsrooms. Um, and when it comes to translating that to the digital space, you know, I think there are some there are some additional complications um, because it, uh, putting a correction at the bottom of the story is not always you know the most appropriate thing to do. Um, sometimes you have to correct it in a different place. You have to correct it on different platforms, like CNN did. Yeah. Um, uh, on Facebook, and I don't know if they did it on Twitter as well. Well, especially if you're reporting on Facebook or Twitter, too. Right, mm -hmm. Which yeah. I think uh, a lot of, especially at the local level, um, a lot of reporters right. do. Right. Yeah. And then... Have uh, direct access. Right. And then there's the other complications um, where, you know, some websites uh, or some news organizations that have websites um, decide to take a story down instead of correcting it or take it down temporarily and then mm -hmm. correct it. Um, so there are all those sort of balls in the air, and I think they're very dependent on what kind of mistake it was, and what kind of um, story it was, and where the story appeared, and all those things. And I, I still think that that's something um, that we're working through, and the, the local newsrooms are working through as well. Not just ours, but mm -hmm. publicly. Cool. Mm -hmm. Any advice for them if, as they're trying to develop these policies? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is um, just having the conversation is it really a really good step. You know, asking, you want to see if, if in your newsroom, even if it's a very small newsroom, are people doing things in different ways, you know, because um, you want consistency ac across your platform. So figure out if there are practices that are already in place. Um, are they being, you know, performed universally? And a, apart from that, I would, I would you know, suggest a few principles. So one is that you don't want to scrub away mistakes online. So what that means is if you know there's a mistake in a story of a factual nature, you don't go in, just change it, and save a new version. You change it, but you also add a correction to acknowledge it. And so, so adding that correction is still, even though we can make it disappear, we don't do that. So that's one sort of ethical principle I think people need to keep. The second you guys sort of hinted on, which is you need to match the correction to the platforms where the, the air flowed. Mm -hmm. So if you have you know, a Facebook page and it went there as well, it's good to put a correction up. Um, if it's shared on Twitter, it's good to do a correction. And one, one thing for people who may be hesitant about that, thinking, well, this is going to hurt our reputation if we put our, you know, our corrections everywhere, it's actually the opposite. Um, you know, the studies that have been done about accuracy and about errors and the way that, in particular, newspaper readers perceive them is that um, the more you're willing to acknowledge your mistakes, the more people are willing to forgive and understand them because they realize that we're going to make mistakes. So readers are actually more suspicious when they don't see corrections than when they see them. When they see corrections, they see that, okay, there's an accountability structure here in place. So corrections are a good thing. They actually help build trust rather than destroy it. And, and taking it with that approach as a starting point kind of liberates people a little bit more to be a little more public about their mistakes. And it's a kind of a paradox. The more you admit your failings, the more you're worthy of trust, which is, um, I think, one thing that we sometimes forget. But, you know, I would definitely say that 
the, the most basic thing is figure out what's being done now. Is it consistent? If it's not, you know, put together a small committee to come up with some consistent practices. Make sure they take in some of the new platforms um, and the new approaches. You know, don't allow scrubbing. And when it comes to unpublishing, unless it's a really serious legal situation, you want to avoid unpublishing. It's better to acknowledge it. Um, but if there's something that's just clearly libelous um, and you've been getting lawyers' letters about it, you know, then that's, that's a case where you do want to take it down. But it, it's something you really want to avoid. Well, Craig, thank you so much for stopping by Thunderdome this afternoon and chatting with us about real-time reporting and sponge and errors and all that great stuff. I, I talked about more than two things, didn't I? You did. Oh, uh, you, you wore me down, you Thunderdome yeah. people. Oh. It was an intense interview. <laughs> Julie, thank you for taking some time out of your afternoon. No problem. Thank you. Um, <laughs>